Before delving into recent events, let's start with D-Day, which occurred in the spring of 2017. At that time, my wife and I were about 30 years old. We had been together since our student years, and we also had a child attending elementary school. Initially, I had suspicions about my wife having an extramarital relationship, but when I expressed my concerns, they were immediately rejected. Over time, my fears were confirmed, and I, having evidence, made claims to her. Despite her persistent denial, she eventually gave up and confessed her guilt, shedding tears and begging for forgiveness. At that moment, my internal reaction was to demand her immediate departure and begin the process of filing for divorce. It is important to recount how the events that led to the disclosure of her infidelity unfolded. Although it did not come to physical intimacy, there were already plans for an intimate meeting a few months before that fateful day. I noticed that my wife began to use the phone more and more often, showing increased caution. She turned away from me when she used the phone and quickly put it away when I entered the room. I also noticed that she took it with her to the bath or shower, which seemed strange to me. But at first, I did not attach any importance to this since it did not raise serious suspicions. Then, there was one incident that really caught my attention. We had always freely used each other's phones without any shyness. If one of us asked to see the other's phone, we just handed it over without any questions. But the day I wanted to find a new restaurant, it was obvious that something was wrong. I offered to visit a new restaurant, but at that moment, my phone was charging. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked her to lend me her phone. When she asked about the reason, I explained it to her, but she hesitated to give me the phone. She found the menu and shared it with me but did not let go of her phone all the time. This, along with other behaviors, began to arouse my suspicions. After pondering my fears for several days, I finally plucked up the courage and asked her directly if something was going on between her and someone else. In response, she reassured me that nothing was happening. One of her close friends was facing a deeply personal and sensitive issue, and she was determined to preserve their privacy. She assured me of her love and devotion to our relationship and family, making it clear that she would never jeopardize what we have. It was reasonable for her to give preference to supporting a friend, and I decided to leave everything as it was. But despite all my efforts, an uneasy feeling in my stomach did not dissipate, suggesting that there was something more to this situation. The suspicious behavior seemed to have stopped, or so I thought. Additionally, a significant incident occurred that further convinced me that something unusual was happening. I will try to approach this delicately, although I believe that the details are of great importance. One afternoon, when we were in an intimate setting, she suddenly reached for her phone, expressing a desire to record the process on video. This was quite unusual, as she is usually reserved and always felt somewhat insecure around cameras, even in a normal setting. So, I found it rather strange, but I assumed that maybe she wanted to add some spice to our experience. Curiosity got the better of me and I asked about the purpose of using the camera. A little embarrassed, she said that she wanted to observe herself, seeing this new adventurous side of her. I approved of the idea and decided to agree. She started her performance by setting up a camera and filming herself on a selfie camera, magnifying the image on her face, capturing every detail of her intense engagement. I was pleasantly surprised by her active participation because she usually did this only at my request. But this time, she readily agreed, without taking her eyes off the camera, radiating captivating enthusiasm. The sensual sounds she made intensified the intensity of what was happening and fascinated me. When the performance reached its climax, she went further, demonstrating the achievement in front of the camera. I regret that I have to acknowledge the importance of this video in the future, but it certainly matters. Despite the obvious deviation from our usual behavior, I decided not to make a fuss about it not wanting to embarrass or discourage her from adventures. Instead, I maintained a sense of normalcy, secretly hoping that we could explore this new experience together. But since my wife and I have been in a committed relationship since the age of 20, her sudden change in character caused a familiar instinctive feeling in me. A few weeks after the video incident, I decided to check her phone for suspicious messages or photos. After checking the phone, I didn't find anything unusual. It was only later that I remembered that we used the backup function together, which automatically saved pictures from the camera in Google Photos. Realizing this, 
I logged into my laptop, where she had a user profile, and used the saved credentials for further investigation. When I checked her email, everything seemed normal until I came across her photo collection. To my surprise, there was a huge amount of candid photos and videos taken by her in the past, about four months ago. They weren't meant for me, as I had never seen them before. It turned out that she deleted them from her phone but forgot to delete them from the backup. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to continue the search by opening the video camera on her phone and scrolling through the discovered content. Before entering into a conversation with her, I decided to rewrite this material in case she remembers and erases it. I kept this information for several days, trying to treat it with understanding and considering possible explanations for its presence. At that time, OnlyFans had not yet gained much popularity, so initially, I thought that she could post explicit materials online, but that would be completely out of character for her. I emphasized that she has always been very reserved and discreet. I honestly couldn't imagine how this could be explained except that she has a romantic relationship with someone else. Once again, I expressed my suspicions to her and said that something was wrong, but I refrained from announcing the facts I discovered because I really wanted her to give an explanation that would debunk my doubts and make me feel foolish. In response, she was slightly offended, reminding us that we had already discussed this issue and, of course, denying her relationship with another man. There was a lack of any activity. I asked her again if she needed to share something or speak out, and again she refused. In the run-up to this conversation, I got access to her Google account again. Accordingly, I presented her with all the information I received and demanded an explanation from her about the contents of her Google account. Her initial reaction was surprised, but she quickly pulled herself together. She accused me of ruining an unexpected anniversary gift she had planned for me. Knowing that we both travel a lot, she wanted to give me something interesting for the time of our separation. But I remained skeptical and decided to play a bluff. I told her that I had access not only to her Google account, hoping that this would force her to admit the truth. On my ultimatum to leave if she didn't confess, she couldn't hold back her tears and insisted that everything was not as it seemed. Apologizing, she asked for forgiveness. She claimed that she had done nothing wrong but only acted foolishly. When I asked what kind of person she was talking about, she called him her colleague. They first met at a work event at the end of 2016, about seven months before this momentous event. Interestingly, he holds a similar position in another branch of the same company located in another major city about 200 miles away from us. At first, they communicated by email mainly on work issues. After exchanging numbers, she stressed that given his extensive experience in this position, her only intention was to get professional advice and share tips. It was her recent promotion to a similar position that triggered the beginning of their correspondence, which mainly concerned work issues. Gradually, more personal topics began to appear in their correspondence, and he began to flirt, to which she willingly reciprocated. Realizing the need for privacy, he offered to transfer their communication to an encrypted messaging application. From my point of view, this man had a tendency to pursue married women, which seemed very unpleasant to me. As a result, these first messages were deleted, so I never saw them, but the rest of their conversation was preserved in the messaging app they used. When I said I wanted to watch, she resisted and began to emotionally dissuade me from watching. At the same time, I reminded her that I was ready to leave if she wasn't completely honest with me. In the end, she reluctantly opened the app, handed it to me, and curled up with her head in her lap. The content of the messages was disgusting. It was filled with explicit words as well as provocative photos and videos. Both interlocutors seemed excited about the upcoming summer working event in which they had to spend two nights in a hotel. Their messages were shockingly graphic, detailing what they planned to do to each other. As I continued reading, my thoughts immediately returned to the video I mentioned earlier. I asked if she had sent him this video, but in response, she burst into tears even more. Trying to gather more information, I scrolled through the conversation thread until I came across a video. To my horror, I saw that they were exchanging numerous notes discussing him. He even expressed pleasure from indulging in pleasure while watching the video, and she replied that it turns her on. This revelation made a deep impression on me, and I felt deeply offended. I was struck not only by the fact that she shared a very personal and intimate video with him but also that it was an emotional betrayal. 
participation in such a vulnerable action was completely alien to me. Let me explain that I have never done or shared explicit photos, let alone sent them. Just the thought of sharing such an intimate picture with someone, especially someone she was related to, was incredibly frightening to me. But they both managed to involve me in their past relationships, although I never participated in them of my own free will, maybe not on purpose, but it seemed so. Now, thinking about it, I realize with deep regret that I was just her replacement and an equal participant in that video. I realize that all those worries and experiences that I expected were directed solely for his benefit and not for mine. So, I made the difficult decision to leave and tell her about my desire to divorce. Despite the fact that she moved out, she insisted on her desire to reconcile. To get my bearings in the current situation, I consulted with several divorce lawyers who informed me that a settlement agreement would inevitably lead to a significant decrease in my financial well-being and joint custody of our child. After carefully studying my financial capabilities and having numerous conversations with my parents, I came to this conclusion. Turning to my colleague for advice and trusting my friends, I came to the conclusion that divorce is the most appropriate option. I believe that I could overcome financial difficulties in a reasonable time, which would allow me to retire as I had planned. In addition, I believe that my daughter's well-being would be better if she had contented parents, even if they were no longer married. When I finally reached out to my wife to tell her about my decision to start divorce proceedings, she surprised me by offering a deal. She offered to hold a trial separation for a year during which we will have time to cool down and restore the relationship. After seeking advice from a marriage counselor, I thought about the situation again. If I decided to move on, the consultant would be ready to facilitate the divorce process, which provides for equal custody of the child and a more favorable distribution of property. After careful consideration, I agreed to this decision. I made it clear to my wife that I intend to approach our separation as if I were single. Given the length of our relationship and my limited experience when we first started dating, I felt that I needed to gain more life experience to make an informed decision about our future. I expressed to her my dissatisfaction with her behavior in this way and made it clear that if she considers it unfair or feels uncomfortable in such an unequal position, then we can think about a divorce. Although it was unpleasant for her, she understood my point of view and eventually agreed. Soon after, I started dating other women, including a romantic relationship with a woman I met at the gym that lasted several months. It seems that my wife doubted the sincerity of our relationship. During our first marriage consultation, we introduced ourselves to each other and discussed our circumstances. The marriage counselor asked about my dating status, to which I replied in the affirmative. In response to this, my wife made the following remark, I don't see the point in us going through this if you're dating other women. After the session, I agreed with her opinion and expressed the belief that marriage counseling may not be a useful idea. She subsequently apologized and retracted her words. I told her we could revisit the idea later. Over the next few months, she periodically, often late at night, sent me messages asking why I had treated her like this and whether I had not punished her properly. After about a year and a half, I began to consider the possibility of reconciliation. We successfully engaged in co-parenting and spent time with our daughter as one family. Besides, the dates were incredibly dull. Perhaps it was premature, but disappointment overwhelmed me after numerous dates, and even second and third dates, I realized that I couldn't imagine anything more than casual relationships with the women I dated. As a result, having been divorced for more than a year, I decided to end my dating. This decision allowed me to devote more time to reuniting with my wife. At the beginning of 2019, I invited her to move in with us to rebuild our family. This news caused great joy to my daughter. The restoration of our relationship was based on our common path to raising a child. I can trust my wife endlessly as a mother. She is excellent, and I have full confidence in her ability to make reasonable and responsible financial decisions. In addition, I implicitly trust her to make important medical decisions on my behalf if I am unable to do so. But despite all this, romantic love between us has not been revived. Unfortunately, I no longer feel a deep sense of gratitude for having her in my life. Although in some aspects, our relationship is not true, it does not reduce my overall happiness. I have not lost hope for her return for a long time, but it has been more than four years since we reconciled. It seems that it will never be as good again. Nevertheless, 
I am content to fulfill the role of a responsible partner and devoted father on a daily basis. It used to suit me quite well, but recent events have brought discord into our relationship, and I feel depressed and lost after the betrayal. I really count on the support of others. My best friend and I have been inseparable since we were teenagers. We were next to each other at all important events, from proms to weddings, and even the birth of our children. Despite the busy life, we managed to find time for joint sports several times a week. During the difficult period of our separation from my wife, he was a support for me. He checked on me every day, made sure I took care of myself, and held me accountable. He even made sure that I was responsible for drinking. I tried not to succumb to excessive alcohol addiction and to keep my composure until I regained stability in my life. But after I took over the organization of Thanksgiving last year, the situation began to change. He became distant, often canceled our classes at the gym, and generally avoided communication. At first, I attributed this behavior to being busy during the holiday season, given the family and work responsibilities that usually consume all of us at this time. From time to time, I contacted him by SMS to find out how he was doing, but his answers usually came down to short messages or a simple thumbs-up emoji. I didn't attach much importance to this, perhaps he just needed personal space. I tried to communicate with him and convince him of my sincere care and support, but in January, my wife confronted me with the fact that I had not informed her about the divorce of my closest friend and his wife. I was completely unaware of the situation she was talking about. As it turned out, my friend's wife turned to my wife with a request to help her overcome infidelity and convince her of the need to work on their marriage. In response, my wife just offered her typical advice. She stressed the importance of qualities such as transparency, patience, and respect, and even advised me to read something. But I was struck by his reaction to someone else's situation. Despite the obvious irony in her answer, I refrained from expressing my thoughts. It was very sad for me to watch the pain they caused a person. I, like everyone else, knew about the difficulties they faced and could not understand why they did not turn to me for support. After all, this man gave me incredible support during my wife's infidelity, and I thought he should have known that I would never condemn him. Driven by my anxiety, I started reaching out to him, inviting him to the gym or for a drink, hoping to find solace. We were engaged, for example, in a game of disc golf, but it took a long time to persuade him. When we met, his attitude toward me was far from warm. He seemed terse and unfriendly. But as we talked, he gradually began to tell his story. He said that at some point, his wife told him that they should live separately, as I did. She even suggested that extramarital affairs are common in many marriages. His wife's disbelief in his fidelity led to the fact that he began to think about divorce. It was obvious that he partially blamed me for the current situation. The pain inflicted on me was as sharp as a blade. The mere thought that I had played some role, even the most insignificant, in the cruel fate of my friend's betrayal caused almost as much pain as the discovery of my wife's infidelity did. Did my decision to stay with my wife somehow affect this outcome? Does forgiving infidelity mean that it becomes more tolerable? Is there anything I can do to help my friend? I tried to explain why I decided to stay, emphasizing that our relationship had become purely practical. Our marriage no longer resembled what it was before but I was not confused by his indifference. I think he has every right to be angry, and I sympathize with him. The recent incident has once again touched old emotional wounds, which has significantly worsened our relationship with my wife. It's been two months since our last intimacy, and even eye contact or physical touch has become a difficult task for me. The thought of divorce began to cross my mind again. Fortunately, my daughter has already grown up and is able to cope with the possible consequences of a divorce. I believe that she is at the age when she can express her wishes and opinions about our family situation. I have full confidence in my wife's ability to be a great co-parent, regardless of the state of our relationship. I am depressed by the feeling that we have fallen back a lot, and I feel a strong sense of guilt. Moreover, I am somewhat disgusted by my actions. Have any of you ever experienced this overwhelming sense of guilt, especially at such an advanced stage? How do you deal with it? Logically. I understand that I am not to blame, but his criticism puts a lot of pressure on my conscience. I can't help him the same way he once helped me. I am genuinely at a loss for what to do. Any advice or words of support would be greatly appreciated.
I can't help but wonder if cheating has permanently damaged the part of me that is looking for connection and intimacy. After our conversation, I was left with a feeling of emptiness and the absence of any real essence. I remember lying in bed one weekend and thinking about the lack of emotions I should be experiencing. I was in the company of an amazing woman, experiencing a tender and charming moment, but an inexplicable emptiness reigned inside me throughout the meeting. I longed for the deep connection and intimacy that my wife and I once had, but it never arose. This inability to feel burdened me with guilt and deep self-doubt. When my wife and I reconciled, I hoped to regain the deep satisfaction and connection that we once shared. But despite the fact that the physical aspect of our relationship is enjoyable, there is no true satisfaction in it. It seems that I'm just going through motions and not experiencing a genuine connection with my wife. Since the last time I expressed my concerns, there has been some improvement in our relations. We had several conversations, and I have to mention the insight and intelligence of my wife who understood what was bothering me. I asked her why she felt entitled to condemn my friend's wife for behaving the same way as herself. She categorically denied the similarity, claiming that Mike's wife had repeatedly cheated while she herself had never done it. It was obvious that she had convinced herself that she had never wanted to cheat with a third person. I reminded her about our common conversations, to which she replied something like this, I made a big mistake and allowed myself to get carried away by the moment, even though I had no intention of doing anything. She just doesn't get it, or maybe I don't understand it. I'm not sure. On the one hand, I understand that our situation could have been much worse. On the other hand, I can't get rid of the guilt, it still weighs on me. At least we're communicating now. Some people offered psychotherapy, but we never went to marriage counseling after the first session. But my wife attended individual therapy sessions during our separation. My family is going through an ordeal when it comes to the treatment of mental illness. In an era of less understanding, my grandmother was mistreated by mental health professionals, which left an indelible mark on our perception. Therefore, for me, it became a serious obstacle in finding help for myself. I do not know how to overcome this obstacle. As for Mike, I decided to give him the space you all recommended. I contacted him by text message, expressing my support, apologizing for his current difficulties, and assuring him of my presence and support. In response, he gave me a thumbs up, indicating that he needed my help. I couldn't help but feel sorry for him and would like to support him. I am grateful to all of you for becoming an umbrella for me because I can't share these things with anyone in my life. They either condemn me or condemn my wife, which is not good for anyone. I will be very grateful for any advice or words of support. Once again, and another thing, tonight was an unexpected plus. For the first time since the new year and the incident with Mike and his wife, after finishing work, she drank several glasses of wine. From the very beginning, she radiated an undeniable beauty that has always captivated me. Lately, my desire for physical release has been increasing at an alarming rate. Everything is complicated by the fact that, as a result of her infidelity, it turned out that I am not an integral part of her past life. Perhaps I'm just a preference, not an absolute necessity, which means that if I can't satisfy her desires, then someone else will undoubtedly do it. There was no trace of tenderness or intimacy in this meeting. Instead, there was a dark, desperate, and even primal energy in it. As soon as she reached the end, immediately there was a desire to take a shower, which I did. Unfortunately, her feelings were hurt, and they would have been hurt even more if I had rejected her. I'm not sure that such an outcome can be considered a victory for me. I apologize for clouding the mood, but now I am deeply disappointed in myself and in our situation. The fact that I have shared my thoughts here brings me some comfort. When I was growing up, my father inspired me that a man should silently cope with his problems and fulfill his duties since no one cares about our emotional well-being, they value us only for our usefulness. Perhaps it is not surprising that he passed away at such a young age. After the incident I've already described, an awkward tension reigned in our family. To avoid this awkwardness, I deliberately kept my presence to a minimum, which was made possible thanks to my daily routine, which includes work in gym classes. In addition, my daughter and I found solace in our common passion for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. This activity has become a favorite for us, especially considering that various events are held in the gym every evening on weekdays and on Sunday afternoons. 
Therefore, we plunged headlong into this activity, spending a significant amount of time together. At the beginning of February, the news of the death of my mother's sister reached us. Living in a neighboring state, she left behind cherished family photos, heirlooms, and personal belongings that were very important to my mother. Without hesitation, I offered to go on a trip to pick up these valuable items. The agreement on this was reached about three weeks ago, and my wayward wife and I were going to make the trip together last weekend. Just on Friday, as we were getting ready for work, I once again told her about the plans for our Sunday trip and volunteered to go myself, despite the fact that the journey was going to be long, more than four hours in each direction. Although I had already informed her that I could handle it, I reminded her of my past experience with such a trip. She expressed a desire to go, but I convinced her that everything was fine and that she probably had more interesting ways to spend Sunday. However, she insisted on keeping me company and said she didn't mind coming with me. I told her that I wanted her to come with me but stressed that ultimately she decides for herself whether to stay at home or join the trip. In response, she said that of course she wanted to come with me. I had no desire for her to go, not because I didn't want her to, but because I understood that it would be an unpleasant experience for her. Therefore, on Sunday morning, I got up early and made sure that my mother took care of our daughter for the whole day. As soon as everything was settled, I returned home for my wife, ready to hit the road. The first hour of the ride passed in silence, as she had just woken up and does not like to talk in the morning. In the end, we stopped for breakfast, and after refreshing ourselves and drinking some coffee, we started a conversation that mainly concerned our daughter and work. After that, everything took an unexpected turn. Our conversation was casual, consisting of small talk and nothing special. Suddenly, she asked about Mike's well-being, not knowing about his current situation. I confessed my ignorance. This revelation puzzled her, considering that we have always been linked by a close friendship. I explained that I hadn't had any meetings with him since our last meeting over drinks a few months ago. Perplexed, she asked if there was any particular incident that caused our separation. I explained that the whole point was that we were both busy with our lives, which made it difficult for us to communicate. Despite my attempts to change the conversation, she didn't want to back down. She began to criticize me, claiming that I did not support a friend and expressing disappointment about my absence during difficult times for him. She insisted that the reason for his difficulties was his wife's infidelity and the upcoming divorce. Although I felt the tension rising in me, I managed to contain it. Instead, I calmly told her that I no longer wanted to continue the conversation and drown out her words by turning on the sound of my music podcast. Deep down, I knew that this conversation was inevitable and had to take place. I have always been better able to express my thoughts in writing than to speak spontaneously. In order to prepare for this conversation, I actively participated in discussions on the internet, which turned out to be useful. In addition, I keep a diary where I write down the questions that I need answers to and formulate my thoughts that I want to convey to the audience. Although I am aware of my stubbornness, the invaluable advice I have received from everyone here has really had a significant impact on me. Without thinking twice, I decided to turn down the volume of the stereo system. I told her about my meeting with Mike, explaining that his wife, like me, encouraged him to live separately. I stressed that infidelity unfortunately had become commonplace in marriage, which led him to believe that his reaction had been exaggerated. I told her that there was some truth in his wife's point of view and suggested that by staying with a cheater, a person unwittingly normalizes the act of treason. In addition, I expressed the opinion that it would be extremely important for his wife to witness the consequences that my wife experienced after losing her marriage. Perhaps she wouldn't have taken the actions she did. I also mentioned that Mike's divorce, in our conversation about it, caused me painful memories, making me think about her infidelity and about our marriage. She reacted to this with some anger and protection, as is often the case, criticizing Mike and once again objecting to the fact that I called her relationship with a colleague treason. Trying to avoid a difficult discussion, I advised her not to pay attention to this issue, admitting that I regretted raising it and suggesting instead to focus on the beauty of trees and flowers. In this regard, I turned on the radio again, and we spent about 30 minutes in awkward silence. In the end, she seemed to calm down, apologized, and expressed a desire to talk. Reluctantly, I agreed, allowing her to continue the conversation. 
Her first question was whether I still loved her, to which I answered honestly, admitting that I was not sure. She said she knew about my feelings for her. Curious, I asked how she could be sure of that if I couldn't figure it out myself. In response, she said that love is an action, not just a feeling. She said that she feels my love because I am devoted to our family. I am a devoted father. I faithfully fulfill my duties every day and even received her in our house during our separation. Even in the most difficult times, she trusted me infinitely. When she needed me, she knew she could rely on me without hesitation. Being next to me, she felt confident, both for herself and for our daughter. She believed that all my actions stem from love. And if she felt that I loved her, she considered it real affection. She asked me inquisitively if I believed she loved me. I confidently replied that I knew she loved me and admitted that her life would probably be easier if she decided to leave, and love would be the driving force behind her decision. I wondered why she decided to stay with me despite the fact that she put our family at risk during the betrayal. I couldn't understand how she could claim to love me and still behave like that. I expressed my doubts, suggesting that there must be something insufficient in me that makes her look for connections with another person. I was puzzled why she never raised these issues with me, and I stressed that she should have ended the relationship, not changed. This upset her, and she emphatically stated that the issue of leaving had not even been considered by her. She loved me very much, but I could not understand how consistent and logical her words were. I wondered why she would enter into a relationship with another man if she wasn't dissatisfied. I wondered if I hadn't given her enough attention to make her feel wanted and loved. Although she assured me that I had done nothing wrong, she admitted that in our long-term relationship, she began to take these aspects for granted. In this situation, it is quite possible that I did all these actions for her out of a sense of duty or obligation. She also expressed her uncertainty about our relationship, mentioning that she always noticed attention from other women to me. It made her feel inferior, as if she didn't have a special place in my life. She believed that without her presence, I would have had many alternatives. It was this fact that attracted her to a partner who turned out to be much older than us, short and bald. This man had a big belly, who was the complete opposite of me in appearance. She mentioned that she had seen photos of his wife. His wife looked like an average middle-aged woman, quite normal but not particularly attractive. Compared to her, my wife was younger and more attractive, and he felt that she had a special place in his heart. Thanks to his undivided attention, she felt incredibly confident and valuable. She found great pleasure in the intense, almost obsessive desire that he felt for her. She understood that she was the only one causing him such strong emotions. It had an intoxicating effect on her, almost like a potent substance. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked if she had any suspicions or concerns about my loyalty. To my surprise, she replied with a firm refusal. She absolutely trusted me, was sure that my strong sense of loyalty and devotion would not allow treason, even if such a desire arose. But when I started dating other women during our breakup, her perception changed dramatically. The shock and disbelief she experienced manifested itself in her violent reaction. I asked why I was not worthy of receiving the same loyalty and devotion from her. In response, she resolutely said that she was loyal and devoted to me, stressing that she would never change me. But I reminded her that messages were found in their chat about the intention to meet and enter into a physical relationship during a regional event of their company. To my surprise, she brushed him off claiming that she was just flattering his ego and that the company does not plan to send her to the event this year since it is held on a shift basis. She did this solely to support his faith and ensure a constant flow of attention. Curious, I asked if she was attracted to him, to which she grinningly denied it. I expressed my bewilderment, explaining that her statements look contradictory and cannot be true at the same time. In response, she made a comparison between her relationship by SMS and the man's use of explicit content to increase energy levels. There is enthusiasm and anticipation around her and his partner, which indicates a strong bond between them. But it is important to note that this does not mean a lack of love or a desire to be with someone else. Such moods contrast sharply with the experiences of a person discussing his love partner, who felt cheerful and inspired by the attention he received from her. As a result, her connection with me has become even more pleasant. This prompted me to think about how intense and assertive our relationship was before D-Day. 
she talked about her feelings with great enthusiasm. According to her, this novel played a crucial role in increasing her self-esteem, and it seemed to her that she could not get enough of my presence. She made it clear that her relationship with him had nothing to do with these feelings. It became obvious that these were the very problems that she diligently solved in therapy. On the other hand, I myself have never turned to a therapist because, for me, it has always been a difficult topic. Mental health problems were characteristic of my father's family, who suffered from serious mental illnesses. Despite his condition, he managed to function quite well most of the time. He experienced only occasional bouts of delirium. On the contrary, his mother's condition was much more severe, which repeatedly led to her being placed in psychiatric clinics since she posed a real danger to both her family and herself. In the 60s and 70s, when she worked in the psychiatric care system, the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses were far from what they are today. As a result, my father witnessed how his mother was subjected to extremely cruel and inadequate care. As a child of a father who was constantly afraid of doctors and hospitals, I also developed a deep-rooted distrust of mental health professionals. The constant worry that my father would be suddenly separated from his family during bouts of illness filled me with anxiety. Fortunately, I managed to avoid the same problems that my father and grandmother had. Moreover, having passed the age at which the symptoms of the disease usually appear, I became more inclined to ignore the emerging signs. I decided to abandon the idea of marriage counseling after one meeting. I was actively looking for justification, and although I first met with two psychotherapists, I felt extremely uncomfortable and decided not to continue working with either of them. Now, I do not know how to overcome all the emotional burden that I carry. Perhaps therapy could be beneficial, but I am afraid that my spouse can only share what is beneficial to her. This is a dilemma. When we got to our destination, we began to pack my aunt's things. Spending a few hours with my uncle has become a habit for me but there is always a strange feeling that accompanies the work of sorting out a person's things after his death. The first time I experienced this disturbing feeling was when my father died. It struck me that all their possessions remained, but they themselves were no longer there. Their whole life fit into some objects, and among them, there are many things that may seem insignificant to us, but for them, they were of great importance. Unfortunately, we will never understand the reasons for their attachment. In a heavy and solemn atmosphere, we returned home, reflecting on the difficult process of sorting out my aunt's things. We both went over our detailed conversation and memory, feeling all its weight. Exhausted by the long day, we delved into our relationship and thought about seeking marriage counseling, although I doubted it. I promised her that I would seriously consider this idea. As for the details of her affair and the person who participated in it, I do not know how to understand them. Should I trust her story, and even if I do, will it bring me any consolation or will it upset me even more? I'm not sure yet. We talked much deeper than before, and I believe that driving a car played a role in the fact that we were able to open up. Since we didn't have to look into each other's eyes, it was almost like being in a confession booth. It seems to me that it is much more pleasant when some of our problems are open. Perhaps this will allow us to move on together, regardless of whether it will lead to a stronger marriage or a decision to break up. But nevertheless, it means progress, and I find encouragement in the fact that we both persevered through the discomfort to have this conversation. I managed not to withdraw into myself, and this is already a positive step. She managed to overcome her defensive attitude, which in the past always interfered with conversation. I may have played a role in her tendency to downplay some issues. I'm not saying that her act wasn't serious because it definitely was, and it continues to put the relationship at risk. But in my opinion, Mike's wife's infidelity was much more serious. She had an affair with a mutual friend with whom they all spent time together, and her husband also considered him a friend. Throughout the novel, it was evident that she repeatedly entered into an affair with her partner, even within their common home and in their bed. Thinking about it, I couldn't help but admit that if my wife had shown even a fraction of such disrespect to me, I would have quickly put an end to our relationship. I firmly believe that if she had taken their illicit relationship beyond the virtual space and moved on to a physical personal affair, I would have left without hesitation. This part of the conversation bothered me, but I must pay tribute to the courage of my wife who reported the affair to the HR department, given the strict company policy prohibiting fraternal relations. 
I also made it clear to the other person's spouse that if she doesn't take action, I will, and stress the importance of proper behavior if we want to postpone the divorce process. Therefore, I am not sure how great her merit is. Anyway, the unfaithful wife eventually decided to quit her job after the situation became public. Otherwise, there was a possibility that she could face dismissal, although this is doubtful given her experience and the role of her professional mentor. However, this would have caused complications and would have led to his dismissal. Apparently, the spouse who was betrayed by his actions also decided to divorce him, and my wife and I continue to preserve our family, gradually establishing our intimate and spiritual relations. Story 2 My name is Ben, short for Benjamin Timothy Haggard Shannon, and I have been married for seven years. But things haven't been going well lately. Despite all my efforts, I can't get rid of the feeling of dissatisfaction with how our relationship has developed over a long time. This feeling has not left me for about six weeks. Even before an unexpected photo got into the frame, the tension between Shannon and me has been building, especially in the last few days, and I suspect that her sister Nita is somehow involved in this story. After I received this photo, I found myself at work outside the city, which turned out to be more ambitious than the one I was used to. There was a critical problem with the main refrigeration unit at Purdue University, and despite all efforts, the team could not solve it. As an employee of the reputable Fraser HVAC company, I was one of two highly qualified engineers responsible for solving such emergencies. By a happy coincidence, it was my turn to be on duty during the week. So, on Tuesday, I went on a four-hour trip to West Lafayette and stayed there until Thursday. Only around 9 o'clock in the evening, we managed to solve the problem. Exhausted, I decided to have dinner at the nearest institution on the university grounds, and by about 10 p.m., completely exhausted by the events of the day, I went to my hotel room. I quickly sent Shannon a message, telling her I was going to bed and we would continue testing the system the next morning. I also mentioned that I would meet her for dinner on Friday. After taking a refreshing shower, I got ready for bed while the ESPN program played in the background. Unexpectedly, I received a message from Roland Bruton, my closest colleague at Fraser. The message included an apology and a photo taken that evening at Casa del Roland. Roland asked me to call him if I wanted to discuss this further. The attached photo showed a couple sitting at a table in a cozy restaurant, leaning against each other and resting their elbows on the table as their hands intertwined, their gaze locked onto each other. It was about Shannon, my beloved wife. Standing next to her was Eric Chesterton, a colleague from the OSU library. I have never treated Eric with special warmth, considering him some kind of weirdo, but the idea that he might be related to my wife never crossed my mind. Of course, our relationship has been strained lately, but the idea that Shannon would betray me with another man did not fit into my head. Realizing that further inaction would only fuel my growing anger, I decided to turn off the TV and contact Roland. I apologize for disturbing your Thursday night, I paused, realizing the situation well. Roland, it's time to talk about what you witnessed, he explained. Emily and I decided to have dinner early. When we were finishing, we noticed them on the opposite side of the restaurant. Emily noticed them first and asked, Oh no, pro, is that Shannon? Intrigued, I watched them for a while and took pictures. Fortunately, they did not make any affectionate gestures, such as kissing or inappropriate actions. They seemed to be deeply engaged in conversation, which reflected the scene captured in the photograph. There was a note of remorse in his voice as he exhaled loudly, addressing me. I offer my deepest apologies, Ben. Did you happen to witness their departure? Do you have any information about whether they left together and where they were going? I asked, reflecting on the incident. He added, we patiently watched them from our car in the parking lot for a short time, but they never showed up. In the end, we decided to leave immediately, sending you a photo. I apologize for the fact that we hurried to leave without waiting for them but apparently they have just received their drinks and have not yet started eating, which suggests that they have a significant weight ahead of them. There was a heavy silence. We were both confused, not knowing what else to say. Finally, he spoke, expressing his understanding. I understand now. My friend Emily wanted me to give you my warm regards. She's very angry with Shannon, and I share her feelings, although it hasn't sunk in yet. I'm sure I'll be furious in a few hours. 
By the way, is the Purdue job done? When can you come home? Yes, we plan to test it tomorrow morning, and after that, I will make a four-hour trip back. This will give me time to calm down and remind myself that it is impossible to act impulsively, I grinned. Deep down, he knew that I would never resort to violence against Shannon, and Roland knew it perfectly well. Listen, my friend, Emily and I have been discussing something, but it's probably premature to bring up this topic. If you ever need a place to stay overnight, we have a guest room designed specifically for you. We will be glad to see you as a guest. Thank you, Roland. I really appreciate it. I don't know what I will do next yet, but I will definitely think about your proposal. After a few more minutes of quiet conversation, I ended the conversation. I turned off the light, lay down, and fell asleep almost instantly. By the way, no marriage is perfect, right? Despite all our shortcomings, I sincerely loved Shannon and did everything possible to make her happy for seven years, including three years of dating. Of the four years we were married, there were constant problems. According to my observations, the main problems were money and sex. Fortunately, we didn't have any problems in these areas. Neither of us was a wasteful spender, and our intimate connection remained as important to both of us as it was in the first months of our relationship. Although things had become more mundane and less unexpected and intense, Shannon and I still wanted each other equally. No, for us, the problem was not related to finances or intimate life, but with Nita. She was 35 years old, about four years older than Shannon and me. Her husband, Alex, on the other hand, was no better. He was a vain lawyer who considered himself superior to everyone. But at least I didn't have to endure his presence so often. Shannon always looked up to her older sister Nita, who seemed to be a regular guest in her house and constantly gave unsolicited advice on how we should live. Shannon, it would be more logical to keep the dishes in this cupboard and move the spices here, she said. Does Ben still use a gas grill? Charcoal emphasizes the taste of meat much better. And don't even talk about the disgusting green chair. According to her, it's Scream Trailer Park. In general, you have caught the essence. It upset me to the core that Shannon was never able to resist the thread and ask her to leave. The most unpleasant thing, and I will spare you the detailed enumeration of Nita's other misdeeds, was that she constantly humiliated me behind my back. If I was in the room, she was too nice, endlessly praising me for being nice to Shannon, for being caring, for being so helpful around the house, while poor Alex, according to her, could not even change a light bulb. But more than once, I overheard her disparaging me when she thought I wasn't around. One day, she and Shannon were enjoying a cup of coffee in the kitchen when I quietly entered through the back door after a jock. Shannon, darling, you know how much I adore you, but I have to admit that Ben, well, he can be a bit uncouth. He doesn't have the same appeal as Christopher or even Tom. Besides, despite his higher education, why does he work with his hands? Honestly, you could have chosen someone much better. I couldn't understand her thinking, especially considering that by that time, we had been married for almost two years. It's frustrating to see how Nita keeps reminiscing about Shannon's past boyfriends and what she said next time I was shocked. Are you seriously thinking about having children with him? She asked, feeling upset. Literally five minutes later, she appeared in front of me with a smile and said, Hi, Ben. Shannon and I were just talking about what a wonderful husband she has. I couldn't believe it. Shannon and I have argued about this countless times, and although she has calmed me down, she has never taken any action to solve this problem. But need is not that bad. She actually likes you, she said. But I waved her words away. How can you stand it when she says that? You're definitely not going to have children with me. I exclaimed, feeling overwhelmed with emotions. I was pacing back and forth in the bedroom, consumed by anger. Disappointment overwhelmed me and I was afraid that I was on the verge of losing my mind. My wife tried to calm me down, explaining that she was just venting her discontent and that she loved me despite her tendency to incite quarrels. But this quarrel was undoubtedly one of the most terrible in our lives. I couldn't contain my emotions and ended up saying a few rude words, after which I ran out of the house. I was gone for six long hours, seeking solace in the company of my friend Raphael, the bartender at Bob's restaurant. Mostly. I just sat there, trying to clear my head. When I got home at midnight, I found her sleeping in her bed, 
turning away from me. The atmosphere was tense, and our conversation was limited to a simple exchange of good morning wishes and a request to bring more coffee. Within a few days, the situation began to improve and become increasingly warm, but it was never fully resolved. It was clear to me that Shannon loved me, but I couldn't understand why she didn't want to take my side for once and ask her sister to stop humiliating me. The only way out for me was to avoid Nita for as long as possible, making up excuses so that I would not be at home when she came. Besides, I tried to minimize conversations about her with Shannon. As I mentioned, the weeks leading up to my trip to West Lafayette were particularly stressful. Oddly enough, Nita was present in the house more often than ever before. It turned out that almost every day when I came home from work, she and Shannon had important conversations in the kitchen. Perhaps for this or another reason, Shannon began to treat me colder and more distant. She realized that it was not worth mentioning her sister in my presence, leaving me in the dark about what was going on with Nita. But apparently, Shannon still distanced herself from me. Although our communication remained polite, who needs simple politeness with his wife? She became cautious around me, and our intimacy decreased noticeably. Recently, Shannon and I have been estranged from each other for several weeks. We exchanged only the usual hugs because of the strange atmosphere. It was difficult for me to approach her, and I was on the verge of giving up. Our intimate relationships have also become routine. There have been only a few of them over the past month. Although I'm not very good at deep conversations, I did try once or twice. I asked Shannon if something was bothering her, if we needed to have a serious conversation. I wanted to solve all the problems between us, but she said it was all right. She said she was worried about changes at work and some minor problems with Nita, but nothing that would require special attention. I appreciate your concern, dear, a forced grin and a peck on the cheek. That's all I got in response. This behavior continued for quite a long time, and I decided to turn to Aunt Gwen for a long conversation. Aunt Gwen, my mother's younger sister, played a significant role in my upbringing after my father's death and my mother's subsequent illness. Although she now lives in Seattle, we often talked on the phone. If anyone could help me decipher Shannon's behavior, it was undoubtedly Gwen. When I got back from Purdue, I decided to call her over the weekend. After receiving the photo from Roland, I made a clear effort to put aside all this confusion and focus on my work. On Friday morning, my main task was to test the capabilities of the system, make sure that it would cope with the load, and quickly leave the situation behind. By about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we had successfully completed all the necessary checks. As a token of gratitude, the Purdue team invited me to a quick lunch, after which I went home. Throughout the 200-mile journey, my mind was consumed with a lot of puzzled questions. Had they already slept together, or were they just going to? Did my actions lead to such a situation? Besides, I couldn't help but wonder if her feelings for him were sincere or if it was just a passing fun with someone new. Would I be able to find the strength to forgive everything that happened, or is our relationship already irreparable? And was Nita somehow involved in this? Did she encourage her sister's actions? Perhaps as I approached Columbus in the chaotic Friday traffic jams, I didn't find a clear answer. But I knew I wasn't ready to go home and face her. After thinking about Roland's generous offer to take his guest room, I eventually chose a modest room at the Motel 6, a hearty steak and beer at the Outback, and another night of solitude. With a sense of satisfaction, I wrote Shannon as little affectionate message as possible. I'm almost done, and I have to go home tomorrow. No affection, no heart emoticon. There was nothing but the bare minimum necessary for her to know that I was alive. She replied, Okay, honey. I miss you. Yes, that's right. It was about 9.30 when I drove back to our street, drove slowly past our house, looking for unfamiliar cars parked nearby. I didn't notice anything unusual. The house was dark, except for our bedroom where, judging by the curtains, the TV was on. Disappointed, I returned to Motel 6 and went to bed. When I returned to the house shortly before noon, there was no hurry. I couldn't help but feel a wave of emptiness and indifference wash over me. If earlier I was consumed by anger, resentment, and vindictive thoughts, now I longed for a denouement. I needed to find out the truth, assess the consequences of this ordeal, and face them face to face. Shannon's absence and the eerie silence in the house only intensified my emotions. 
Entering the house through a side door, I went up the stairs to freshen up and put my things in order. And then went down to the kitchen to make a sandwich. My gaze involuntarily darted to the front door. I stood paralyzed and motionless. A large suitcase stood untouched at the entrance. Approaching it, I felt its weight, which indicated that it was filled to capacity. Time seemed to slip away from me, and I couldn't figure out how long I had been fixating on this when the silence was broken by the sound of a side door opening. Shannon came in, greeting me softly, hello, baby, with an unusual half-smile adorning her face. She came up to me and hugged me with a warm and gentle hug. It was more like the tender embrace of a grandmother who came to visit than the passionate embrace of a husband and wife after a week of separation. I couldn't take my eyes off her. I wasn't going to raise my voice or make a scandal, I just wanted to sort out the situation. She led me back to the kitchen, holding my hand, and we sat down at the table opposite each other. You must be tired, Ben. Have you eaten? Can I cook you lunch? What is it? She asked anxiously. I'm fine, I replied, fixing my attention on her face. Leaning closer, she said seriously, I need to talk to you, my love, and this is urgent. I'm really sorry. She was watching me patiently, waiting for an answer, but I was silent. Eventually, she asked, can I ask you something? I earnestly ask you to remain calm and refrain from anger towards me. Please let me tell the whole story before giving any thoughts or opinions. I understand that I'm asking a lot, but please. I nodded in agreement. All I wanted was for the situation to be resolved. She took a deep breath and began, it's about Nita. To my surprise, I suddenly felt that I was getting angry. What does this rude woman have to do with it? I exclaimed. Shannon begged, her face filled with panic. Ben, please, I'm begging you, just listen. I realized that my fists were tightly clenched and that I was holding my breath. Slowly, I got up, walked around the kitchen for a while, and then sat down at the table again. I took a deep breath, trying to pull myself together. In the end, I answered, okay, come on, I promise to listen, so I will. I couldn't help but wonder what it would change if she starts talking about her sister now. Then I'd have to endure a longer conversation. After measuring me with a cautious look, she started again, you know, I've been spending a lot of time with her lately. I thought you could understand how it affects me, creates such tension. Things had changed for the worse between Alex and her. She suspects him of treason. About a month ago, she found him in the office on the table with one of his assistants. I watched the unfolding scene, feeling a strong sense of sympathy for Nita. Needless to say, it was an incredibly difficult time for her. Nita felt deep heartache and anger, not knowing how to handle the situation. Alex constantly apologized, expressed a desire to reconcile, and promised to do everything possible, including consultations to improve their relationship. But everything changed on Tuesday. Depressed, Nita took a break to calm down and then asked Alex to leave and said she wanted a divorce. Is she alright? He used physical force on her, as a result of which she was hospitalized. On Tuesday evening, she got a concussion. At that moment, I forgot for a moment that my own marriage had broken up. I'm sorry, Shannon, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, I said. She bent down and took my hand, expressing gratitude, thank you, dear. I understand that you don't like her, and that means a lot to me. Now comes the hardest part, she paused, and then said that she would be discharged from the hospital on Monday, but she had nowhere to go. Alex behaves extremely hard and refuses to leave the house. I want to offer her a guest room where she could stay. Most likely, I will have to take a sick leave and work part-time for a couple of weeks. I want to be close to her and take care of her, she hastened to explain. I understand that you don't like her, and you don't want to be around her, but she has no one else to turn to. Please, Ben, her life is falling apart, and I am her only sister. Shannon, you're right. She's not the kind of person I particularly enjoy being around, but it doesn't matter now. Of course, she can stay with us. Did you really think that I would refuse? She got up excitedly and, going around the table, settled on my lap, wrapping her arms around me. When I looked into her eyes, her face radiated pure joy. Expressing her gratitude, she whispered, Thank you, my love. 
Her lips met mine in a gentle kiss, assuring me that everything would be fine. She swore to protect me and make sure that we saw each other less often. With the utmost sincerity, she promised that she would never let her belittle me again, never again. The happiness emanating from her overwhelmed me, and I couldn't resist hugging her tighter. When I put my head on her shoulder, tears came to my eyes. For a moment, I pulled myself together. I carefully transferred her from my lap to a nearby chair. I went to the sink and poured myself a glass of water, unable to stand the anticipation any longer. Okay, Shannon, can we just finish this? Let's get this over with, whatever it is, I pleaded. She looked at me with confusion, and I couldn't help but express my disappointment. Honestly, you can't even be honest with me, I said. Dear, I sincerely don't understand what you're talking about. What is the rest? She asked, disappointed. I picked up my phone, scrolled through the messages until I found the photo Roland had sent me, and shoved it in her face. This, Shannon. You and this man, I said to her face. The revelation left her speechless. I was momentarily puzzled by the sight of her suitcase at the front door. How could she leave when she was helping her sister move in with us? Before I could finish, she said, Oh, Ben, this is incredibly sad. Carrie, his wife, has a recurrence of breast cancer, and their two-year-old twins are in the center of events. He is absolutely terrified, and my heart is bursting with grief. I stared at her, suddenly realizing the significance of the photo in which she was with a man. Yes, we went to dinner. He really needed someone to talk to. Her prognosis is unclear at the moment. She held my gaze for a moment, conveying a deeper meaning. You really believed it? Oh my god, did you really think it was a romantic dinner? That's how it seems, isn't it? I couldn't even control the tone of my voice. Roland and Emily Bruton definitely had that impression. They are ready to meet you face to face. Before I could say a word or take any action, she hugged me tightly. Benjamin Timothy Haggard, you are the only man I have loved or even considered in the last seven years. Eric is just a friend whose wife is suffering from a terminal illness. I offered him emotional support when he needed it. It was getting harder and harder for me to breathe, not just because she refused to let me go. Moreover, I couldn't help but notice that there has been tension in our environment over the past few weeks. We lacked communication, physical intimacy was scarce. I was consumed with worry about Nita, my love, and I couldn't trust you with this. The mere mention of her name disgusts you, so I carried this burden alone, which led to distance. I apologize for being so distant. My thoughts were focused exclusively on the threat and the vile actions that were committed against her. Okay, I guess I can understand that, but the suitcase caught my attention. It was standing fully packed at the front door. As I looked at it, she gently pulled my head down and kissed me on the lips with a long, sincere kiss, and then met my tear-stained eyes. It was obvious that something had happened. I decided to go to Nita and Alex's house and gather clothes so that she would have everything she needed for the coming weeks. Baby, I'm very sorry about the misunderstanding that happened, she apologized with regret in her voice. I'm very sorry about this misunderstanding, I said regretfully. You've had this photo since Thursday, and I can imagine how you suffered, my love. I'm very sorry, without letting go of my hand, she gently pulled me towards the stairs. Her urgency left no room for delay. We had to solve something extremely important urgently. In the intimate atmosphere of the bedroom, we gently took off our clothes, hugged, exchanged tender kisses, and shed tears of love. We hugged each other tightly, fervently, and passionately making tender love completely immersed in the presence of my soulmate. While we lay feeling sleepy, our hands explored each other's bodies accompanied by intermittent conversations. Really? I asked. Yes, really, she said, her voice filled with affectionate tenderness and playful teasing. I really saw his wife. And did you really think that I was cheating on you? Our friends, Ro and Emily, had the same thought. Although I despise the fact that his wife has cancer, it made me think about the state of my own marriage. I thought it was over, I confessed, feeling a taste of guilt. She expressed her concerns, I believe that one cheater in the family is more than enough, poor Nita. As an epilogue to our conversation, it dawned on me. I'll be damned if it hasn't stopped completely, Nita, 
I must say, she looked completely different, which is not so surprising considering what she had recently been through. At the same time, she expressed great gratitude for being in her house and constantly praised Shannon for becoming her husband. She apologized to me countless times, admitting that she had completely misjudged me. In the end, I insisted that everything was fine and she could stop apologizing, but she still tried to help, even taking on some of the responsibilities of cooking and housework. After she managed to find a fierce and determined lawyer, she finally got the opportunity to gain some financial stability and secure a nice apartment for herself during the chaotic divorce process. Despite the circumstances, he and Shannon continued to spend time together, but it was very nice to have the house at their disposal again. It was a calm and restorative period, almost reminiscent of a second honeymoon. We both acutely realized the value of our relationship and the depth of our affection. Watching a marriage break up and turn into a destructive mess served as a visual reminder to us that we need to cherish and appreciate our own marriage. There are noticeably more smiles at home. Only four months later, we received the joyful news about the recovery of Eric's wife. Despite the fact that Eric continues to be eccentric, I am sincerely happy for their positive outcome.